When asked to describe a distribution, we do it three ways, shape, center, and spread. That's why fx is distributed normally. There's the shape, there's the center, there's the spread. When it comes to, let's say, distribution of incomes, they tend to be skewed to the right. So if we recall, we're going to find the median somewhere maybe about here, or where we will find 50% below and 50% above. But what's going to happen is extreme scores are going to pull the mean average up. So we're going to tend to get a mean average that's more up here. And these extreme scores are also going to tend to inflate the standard deviation so that it's not very realistic. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to um, report for the measure of center the one of the two measures that's not affected by the higher scores. That would be the median. So what we're going to say is, hey, let's make a box plot. Here's the median. We might go down here and we might find the first quartile down here, the lowest score here. We may have to stretch out a little bit to go get the upper quartile. And then we're going to have extreme scores up here and maybe a few outliers. So that's going to be indicative of a skewed right distribution. So that tells us, oops, don't report the mean, don't report the standard deviation because those are affected by extreme scores. Uh, by the way, you, the mean would be really inflated if we had somebody like uh, Warren Buffett leaving, living in the area. Um, but, uh, but that's okay. I wonder what he eats for breakfast. You know, some people, they're so wealthy, they eat money. They eat two, 200K, 300K. He eats special K. It's, it's amazing. Just wondering, though, has anybody ever been brave enough to ask the man if he's aware of the fact that he's been mispronouncing his last name all these years? <laughs> Just saying. But anyhow, skewed right. We're going to report the median and the quartiles. All right, now, if instead we say, hey, there's some company where the lengths of employment are, are uniformly distributed, probably a good company to work for, by the way, if people are staying there a long time. This would be unusual as far as lengths of employment would go, but nevertheless, let's suppose that that's what we have. Well, we can see that that's fairly uniform, so it's symmetric. So we can see that, well, you know what? The median and the mean are both going to be in pretty much the same place. If we go over here, we can find... Uh, where the lower 25% is, there's a box plot. We go over this way, uh, we can designate where the upper 25% are roughly. Hey, that box plot says this is a symmetric distribution. It's uniform. It, there's this range covers 25%. This is 25%, 25%, and 25%. And that's why this interquartile range, this IQR, is important to us. It's where we trap the middle 25%. I'm sorry, the middle 50% 50, 50 of all the scores because every quartile has got 25% in it. So box plots become pretty important to us. So let's suppose we're asked to compare two distributions. If we do that in a free response question, we got to talk about the shape, the center, and the spread of both distributions. But if we stop right there, we're not comparing and contrasting. We don't get full points. And in real life, you haven't really drawn any conclusions or made any comparisons. So it's not enough just to identify the correct shape, center, and spread. We have to be able to also say, oh, so on average, uh, what are the differences? How's the spread for both these? So, so we need to compare them. So anyway, let's take a look at this guy. Distribution one, we have the mean, the median, whatever. Uh, maybe these are two different uh, corporations in two different cities, but they're owned by the same company, uh, so locations in two different cities. And we're seeing the time it takes their employees to complete a certain task. So the first location and the second location, how do they compare to describe their distributions? Well, the first thing you want to do when you're given all this data is to say how far of a gap is there between the mean and the median. We see that there's a one minute gap here. There's only a 0.2 minute gap there. So that's probably not that big a deal. That could be symmetric. We're leaning towards the, the idea that this could be skewed. But just because there's a gap, it's all relative to the quartiles. Well, if we can see, since the first quartile is way down at 15, and our median is only at 15.5, it's actually, I'm sorry, our mean is at 15.5, it's closer to the lower quartile than it is even to the, to the uh, median of the distribution. So we would conclude that this is skewed left. The other thing we could do is take this distribution here and let's make a box plot. The median would be at 16.5 minutes. So we could say, all right, let's put 16.5 minutes right here. That's the median. The lower quartile is at 15 minutes. 
So let's bring that down to about 15 minutes right here. So we'll say this is 15. The upper quartile is 17.5. This gap is one and a half minutes. This gap would only be one minute. So that goes up about like so. The max is at 18.8. That's another 1.3 this way. And the min is down at 12.2. So that's 2.8 this way. That's twice as long. We can see that that distribution tends to be skewed left, skewed towards the lower amounts. And the other thing we can say is, yep, if we look at this even more closely, we can see that the mean is down here, closer to the median, so that is another indicator that it's skewed to the left. So we would say this is skewed left. We would report the center as the median, which is the um, 16.5 minutes, and we don't get to report center deviation. We're going to report the IQR, which is where you'll find the middle 15%, uh, 50 percent, which is the difference between this lower quartile and this upper quartile. That's 2.5 minutes. So that is how we describe this distribution down here. Then we go to the second location. We say, all right, its median is at 16.6. If this is 16.5. Their median is just a little bit above that at 16.6. Their lower quartile is 16.2. So it only comes down maybe to about here. Their upper quartile is 16 point, uh, wait a minute. Their upper quartile is 17.3. Uh, so that comes up to about like so. So that's their distribution, uh, the interquartile range in there. The min is down at 15.5. So their min comes down here to where the mean is of the other distribution, and the max is at uh, 18 minutes. So uh, that's well below what these guys are, so this is up to about there. So that is a box plot showing the second distribution. So again, side-by-side -side box plots, it's a, those are great graphs to give us a lot of information. Well, we can see from the box plot and a careful look at this, that even with the mean average being a little bit above this at about uh, 16.8. It's not a it's not a huge difference, and the distribution pretty much is uniform. So that's what we go with, because it's uniform, and this distribution isn't this mean isn't that far away from the median. Then we're going to say that it, this is fairly symmetric, and you don't even really need to say whether it's uniform or nor, or bell shaped unless you're really really sure. You're better off, you guys, to just say. It's symmetric, so you don't make a boo-boo. All right, and then, so it's symmetric. We would say that we will now report the mean. So for these guys, we're going to say that the mean is what's reported, and that is 16.8. And we're going to say that the, um, that the standard deviation here is, uh, where do we go, uh, 0.5 minutes. So at 0 0.5 minutes would be the standard deviation. And so uh, what we've got is now you could make an argument that this might be slightly skewed to the right because this mean is above the median. But basically when you look at it, I think the better uh, descriptor of the distribution is to say that it's fairly symmetric. All right, hey, kudos to us. We did a pretty good job of describing shape center as spread for both, but if we don't seal the deal and make the comparison, we're making a boo-boo. So here's what we said. We would say at the first location, their distribution tends to be skewed to the left versus the second one, which is more symmetric. The center is here at a median of 16.5 and a mean of 16.8 here. So times are taking maybe on average a little bit longer here, not a huge difference. And then we're seeing much more spread here than we are here now. We're supposed to report the IQR and the standard deviation, you should say that, but you might say for the sake of making a comparison apples to apples, even though standard deviation is the way to go appropriately, we could go ahead and for the sake of making the comparison and, and make sure the reader hears what you're saying, you could say, you know what, let's just really quickly come up with the IQR for this, which is Q3 minus Q1, which is uh, 1.1. So the interquartile range here is 1.1 versus here, which is 2.5 minutes. So again, more spread for this guy. So just draw a conclusion between the two distributions. Uh, a couple more things. Remember how outliers are found. 
They have to be at least 1.5 interquartile ranges beyond Q1 or Q3. Here's the interquartile range right here from 10 to 40. That's a distance of 30. If we take 1.5 times the 30, that's going to give us 45. So starting at Q3, which is right here, if you add 45 to that, any data point beyond that is considered an outlier, which the modified box plot will show us. If we go this way beyond Q1, we can see that there's nothing that's more than 45 units below that, so no outliers on the left side. And then finally, uh, we'll look at this screen, we're good. Uh, remember, if we have scores on a test, and the scores could be bell-shaped, they wouldn't tend to be normal, because to be normal, theoretically, you have to have infinitely many scores that are possible. Hey, test scores aren't usually giving you infinitely many results, so we would say they're bell-shaped. Let's suppose with this mean, this median, this interquartile range, and this standard deviation. So let's suppose some of the scores are here. <laughs> there I am, and there's, you know, all right? But I'm happy with who I am, okay? So we're all, as long as we're okay with ourselves, our parents might not be all right. That's another story. Oh, bad memories. Anyway, so here we got the distribution of test scores. And now, what, a uh, couple things you need to be able to do. You need to be able to define standard deviation in terms that the average person could understand. So what we tend to say in describing the standard deviation is, it's approximately, on average, how far is every score away from the mean. So if you go seven units above the mean of 82 and seven units below the mean of 82, that's going to be kind of on average how far each score is away. These scores are closer to the mean, these scores are further away, but on average, standard deviation is kind of on average how far is every score away from the mean. That's not exactly precise, close enough though, and it's what AP is looking for if they ask you to describe standard deviation. And then, what about this? If this was our original distribution, Describe the distribution if we do some linear transformations. If we multiply all the scores by 10, what happens to the mean? What happens to the uh, IQR and the standard deviation? Well, if we multiply by 10, let's do this one in red. That means these scores, for example, in the middle would become like 820, 830, 840. So we see that all the the scores are 10 times bigger, so the measures of center, the mean and the median, are 10 times bigger. The measures of spread are also 10 times bigger because in the original data here, there was only a difference of one between each of these scores, but now there's a gap of 10. So the gaps between these scores have also gotten 10 times bigger. So the measures of spread are 10 times bigger. I guess the one you gotta be careful about is, variance, it's actually 10 squared times bigger. But if you find the new standard deviation, the new standard deviation would go to 70. You just square that to get the new variance, which would be 70 squared or 4,900. Now, what if instead we just added 10 to all the scores? Now, let's do this one in black. So if we uh, uh, just added 10 to all the scores, the original scores, then the original scores would be transformed. It'd be another linear transformation. Oh, what am I doing? That would be 80, okay, that's, <clears throat> that's wrong. It would be 92, and then this next score would be 93. You'd have a couple 93s, and you'd have a 94. Okay, so what happens to the measures of center, the mean and the median? They all have 10 added to them, so, so uh, the new mean is 10 more than the old mean, but the distances between the scores are still 1. The gap in here is still 1. The gap in here is 1. So the measures of spread do not change. All the scores just got moved up 10 units, so they don't change. But if instead we did uh, both, we added, uh, we multiplied by 10 and then we added 10, the new means, the new measures of uh, center would be 10 times as much as the old mean, for example, and then you would add 10 to that. So that would give you the new mean of the random variable uh, 10x plus 10, its new mean would be distributed this way. Um, but if instead you were talking about standard deviation, uh, this distribution, as far as its standard deviation would go, would only be 10 times as much as the old standard deviation. Only the multiplier can change measures of spread. 
the new standard deviation, the transform standard deviation would not be 10 times bigger than it was before. Those are the big ideas, most of the big ideas when it comes to the initial discussion of univariate data, one variable at a time, and when we have to compare two different populations, single variable.